Good afternoon to everybody. This is Christine Sharkowitz, and I'll be your moderator today uh, for our, our uh, webinar highlighting Google Shopping. We're very excited for today's event, which uh, will cover the most recent developments in Google Shopping and PLA as the market moves towards the final rollout in October. Our expert panel is looking very forward to sharing their latest insights and providing guidance to help make the shift to Google Shopping as smooth as possible and helping to enable you to capitalize on this channel. So with that, I'd like to introduce our presenters. Joining us today, we have Eric Best, Merson's Chairman and CEO. We also have Merson's Vice President of Client Services, Frank Koshinesh. And we also have Merson's Director of Shopping Programs, Anthony Garino. We'd also like to extend a, a personal welcome to Google's um, Head of Platforms for Shopping, John Benverlo. He is Google's uh, main liaison with Mercent and our primary point of contact for coordination around technology. And he also works closely with Mercent's team to jointly serve uh, our retail community. Today, John is on hand to help answer questions specific to the information that our team is presenting and to also offer Google's uh, unique perspective. With that, I'd like to turn the presentation over to Eric Best. Thanks, Christine. Before we get started with our expert content, I'd like to offer a quick introduction to Mercent for everyone joining us today. Mercent's mission in life is to provide three benefits to you as a merchant. We want to ensure that your product catalog and merchandising offers are visible, that your pricing and merchandising offers are competitive, and that your digital marketing campaigns are profitable, inclusive of your advertising, bids, and your cost of goods sold. And we want that to be true wherever and whenever consumers are evaluating or making purchases online. Our history and heritage is in retail at the intersection of e-commerce and digital advertising. Our software as a service platform is built to facilitate your profitable growth. And we are focused specifically on your ability to measure, manage, and optimize uh, the performance of digital campaigns at the product SKU level. And this is central to today's topic of how Google product listing ads and the new Google Shopping program uh, are managed and how you as retailers can maximize your opportunity on Google using the Mercent Retail Platform. Our current customer base is comprised of more than 200 major retailers operating more than 400 unique brands, most of whom are active uh, on Google Shopping today, specifically product listing ads. And in addition to actively supporting these clients selling through Google advertising programs, we also support active integrations with a variety of other online digital marketing channels, ranging from Amazon and eBay to all major online shopping destinations. Specific to Google, Mercent supports customers actively uh, advertising through AdWords paid search marketing programs. We also support product extensions to AdWords, the Google affiliate network, and of course, Google shopping through product listing ads. So with that introduction, I'm pleased to hand the presentation over to Frank Koshnish, our VP of Client Services. Frank? Thanks, Eric. Uh, and thanks, everybody, for joining today. I'm going to guide us through the, the, the main part of the webinar here with Anthony and John uh, also joining in. We're going to cover basically three things. We're going to share some data uh, that we have specifically showing some trends uh, tr in terms of traffic and CPC that we've seen so far in the, the, uh, the migration to Google Shopping. We're going to share some observations of some key uh, experiential points from Google Shopping and the implications that those have. And lastly, we're going to embed some tips and lessons learned as it relates to uh, Google Shopping and specifically how those lessons learned have been honed over the last uh, several weeks. The data we're presenting today is available because Mercent has been working with our clients uh, on Google Product Search, GPS, and Product Listing Ads, PLA, the precursors to Google Shopping, really since the inception of both programs, going back to when uh, they were, were both in beta. Uh, and specifically, we've been very committed to product listing ads um, since, uh, uh, since it was in beta, and has been, as a result, able to develop tools and best practices, as well as extensive sets of longitudinal data of which uh, allow us to develop the kind of thoughts and the data that we're going to share today. So we believe that this provides us with a unique longer-term perspective and track record with which to provide these observations and assess the shift to Google Shopping. The first chunk of, of content here that we're going to share is about the shift. 
and that the shift is underway. And the key theme that we're, we're, uh, that we're seeing is uh, that there is some opportunity. I want to address a couple of key uh, dates and some key facts before we get into that data. Um, as all of you are probably aware, Google is shifting and changing the shopping experience, and mainly with the view of the consumer in mind to provide a more informed and better qualified shopping experience to the consumer. This change and the shift in traffic from the free Google product search uh, to a pay-for-placement Google shopping program model really began in, in mid-June and accelerated uh, at the end of June. And some key dates to keep in mind um, and to recall, and we'll be highlighting a, a couple of these in the next uh, few slides, June 28th was a major milestone when Google exited the testing phase and really started the main migration. And what happened on June 28th is that the product listings on the SERP, the search engine results page, the main Google results uh, page, were all effectively paid listings. So there were no longer at that point, uh, aside from some outliers, free listings on the SERP page. On July 23rd is when PLAs, the paid placements, started to increase incidents on the shopping tab. So now paid placements within the shopping tab, as well as the SERP, started to increase. August 15th is the deadline for having ads into the PLA program to be eligible for the 10% discount that Google's offering. And keep in mind, that's coming up quickly. That's next week. And lastly, October 1st is when this transition will be complete. And effectively, all of the free traffic will be have transitioned from Google product search into the um, paid Google Shopping PLA program. With those dates in mind, um, I want to get into the, the shift that we're seeing and, as I was beginning to describe, how, why we think that there's some opportunity that, that awaits here. The data that, uh, um, that the next several charts are based on is based on a set of um, uh, 51 clients that have been active on both Google product search and product listing ads uh, for at least 15 months. All these clients are medium to large size retailers, and given that the, you know, most of them have been live for you know, 18 months or more, it's a very mature uh, data set um, to give you a, a sense of what's happening. And that's a common question that we get, which is, what is, what is the whole market seeing? So these are a, a large uh, sample set. The first chart is, is that, the, uh, that we want to see is just what is happening to traffic. Um, this is daily traffic from April 1st through the end of July. The blue graph here is daily PLA traffic, and the, the pink is Google product search traffic. The vertical lines highlight those key points. The first blue one is May 31st when Google made their announcement. June 28th is the pink line uh, in the middle. That's when the SERP got affected, and the SERP product listings on the SERP effectively became paid listings. And the green line is July 23rd when PLA incidents on the shopping tab started to increase. So what you can see here is that product search traffic really started to go, go down, you know, somewhere in the middle of June. And as expected, there was a quite dramatic drop right around July, uh, uh, June 28th when the SERP was affected. Um, pretty stable for a period of time there. And then after July 23rd, started to decline some more. So, it, you know, the, the bottom line here when you look at this is that Google product search traffic really is at 25% of the level it was in April and May. So in terms of how far along are we on this migration, this data and from the view, point of view of GPS traffic, we are well past halfway um, on, on our way to October 1st in terms of traffic shift. That, that much was expected. What was somewhat unexpected, at least so far, is that PLA traffic has not yet increased um, to overcome the gap by which Google product search decreased. Now, we certainly expect over time that the blue line here to increase more, but to date have been pretty stable. The next question that we, we often get is, what is PLA as a percentage of uh, text ads? And this here is, the time scale here is a little bit different. This is going back to the beginning of January 2011 when PLA came out of beta as part of a public uh, program. And for uh, many of the clients in the sample set, Merson also uh, has visibility into their paid search text ad performance. And what we're graphing here is sales attributed to PLA divided by sales attributed to P 
paid search tech stats. And what you, what you can see is um, in holiday 2011, that ratio peaked at around, you know, somewhere around 38%. Uh, and was in the, the you know, high 20s and 30s for the bulk of holiday, stabilized post-holiday at around 20% or so. And through the course of this transition, is showing signs that it is increasing, uh, most recently prob- you know, probably in the 30% range. So what this means, and this is an important benchmark for retailers in characterizing and trying to set budgets of what should their PLA program, their Google Shopping program be, um, this suggests that for a, uh, a tranche of retailer clients, that PLA sales are about 30% of their paid search text ad sales. And, and our expectations through the course of this, and as that PLA traffic will increase, because recall from the previous slide that, that uh, as GPS has gone away, we haven't seen a corresponding increase yet in PLA, that this will probably increase. Um, the next question we often get is, what is the effect on, uh, on other channels, um, on comparison shopping or on Amazon. Uh, so for this same sample set of clients, we also looked at daily traffic from April 1st to July 30th uh, on the four biggest comparison shopping engines, Price Grabber, Shop Villa, Shopping, and Next Tag. And the basic finding here is that the impact appears to be neutral, um, that there's been no material effect on traffic that is PLA related. Despite this uh, unusual-looking bump around the July 4th holiday, our research analysis and discussion with our, CS, our comparison shopping partners uh, confirms to us that this is not PLA-related. And aside from the fact and we are aware that some comparison shopping engines are experimenting uh, on uh, Google Shopping and on product listing ads, uh, we feel pretty confident that, uh, that that has not affected this particular data set. Uh, also, Amazon Marketplace. Um, about half of the clients in this particular sample are active on Amazon's third-party marketplace. And as with CFEs, we don't uh, or, or have not yet seen a material impact. Uh, so this, the, the shift to Google Shopping seems to be neutral with respect to the orders uh, and the order volume that these clients are seeing from, from Amazon's uh, marketplace. The last um, particular piece of data trending that I wanted to share uh, relates to costs. And these are, uh, here we're uh, graphing again from April through July, the uh, cost per clicks, the CPCs for PLA uh, for this particular sample of, of clients. And the finding here, like PLA traffic, is also that CPCs have been stable. There are some variations, of course, uh, particularly around the July 4th holiday, but in general, um, these seem stable and we're not seeing any particular breaks up or down with any, particularly not correlated with any one of the, uh, the, the major milestones here. So this is the, you know, the, the data that we wanted to share, uh, which is uh, representative of a large set of, uh, of clients. And the implications for us um, are summarized as lean forward, which means basically be aggressive. Um, and and the, the reason why um, I'm suggesting that is that the stable, PC, uh, stable CPCs and PLA traffic which haven't gone up or down, while at the same time seeing declining GPS traffic, suggests that um, there may be additional traffic that could be bought for by retailers who are aggressive and want to lean forward and test higher bids. And keep in mind that bidding higher does not necessarily mean that your CPC will, will go higher. Uh, so there is, I, I think, some traffic and some uh, sales to be gained here by being more aggressive. And additionally, uh, I think a, you know, a, a, a lean forward position allows you to learn now instead of learning in November or December uh, and also allows you to learn now before PLA incidents and impressions increase further. And additionally, you get the advantage of, taking, uh, of uh, being eligible for the 10% discount that uh, Google's offering. So these are, these are the results that we've seen. Um, John, uh, que- two questions for you now. First question, is this consistent with what Google has seen overall and at large with the, the program shift so far. Thanks, Frank. Yes, I'd say that you know your charts um, are consistent with what we've been seeing. Um, our traffic patterns have certainly been volatile uh, in June and July, and we had uh, told everyone to expect that uh, as we make this transition to the commercial experience. Um, you know, and as the transition proceeds, the free traffic will further decline, uh, and the traffic from PLAs will increase. Um, but I would point out that it's unlikely that those trends would be in lockstep. 
Uh, you know, they vary quite a bit from one uh, product or category of products to another. And I imagine that what you were showing was an index of, you know, the averages across all of your clients. Um, and you guys do have a lot of, a uh, lot of clients representing a lot of GMV, but, um, you know, an individual retailer's experience could be quite different, of course. Yes, absolutely. Especially when we look at it like a, a full data set, there will be some regression to the mean. And I think yeah. you started to answer my, my second question there, John, which is, um, you know, I, I pointed out that so far PLA traffic has been stable through this. Um, you know, can we ex can retailers expect PLA traffic to increase uh, all other things being uh, equal? Yes, I think it's fair to expect traffic from PLA to increase. Um, I, I would uh, like to add that, you know, these changes are driven uh, because of feedback that we've gotten from shoppers and retailers over the years about some of the inherent weaknesses of the product search model that we had. You know, we got a lot of bad data from retailers, um, good retailers who just weren't paying attention to their data uh, because it was a free channel that they couldn't control as part of the problem. And we also had, you know, some bad actors in the system, retailers who were intentionally providing inaccurate data to uh, lure shoppers into their stores. And that was very hard to police. And so I think for many years now, um, we've been, you know, working on ways to improve that situation and, and decided ultimately that the best way to uh, introduce uh, a level playing field for retailers and to improve the quality of the experience for shoppers was to move to this commercial model. Um, where, you know, retailers can control their traffic with a bid, um, assuming they have good content, good products that shoppers want to buy. Um, and, you know, it will reduce the ability of the bad actors to affect um, the shopper's experience. Our founder uh, and current CEO, Larry Page, um, has been personally in real involved in this whole transition. Uh, and he was very dissatisfied with the experience that we provided to shoppers and retailers under product search. Um, and so, you know, if you think about Google's search results page as sort of a, a funnel into shopping results, whether you're thinking about product listing ads on the search results page or you're thinking about the shopping property at shopping.google.com, we can kind of, you know, turn the knob on that spigot to drive more or less traffic. Um, and I think what we're trying to do now is get the experience uh, much improved before we look at, you know, uh, significantly increasing traffic flows to that experience. Great. Well, th thanks, John. I, that's that's very helpful, and um, I, I think it's a, a, a great segue into like the, the next two uh, sections that that I want to touch, which do touch on that experience and under you know when PLAs are and Google Shopping product listings are showing. Um, you know, that the next topic here is. is on Google Shopping is that, that it's not entirely a, a kale turn game. And this really is going to get into when and under what circumstances are PLAs showing based on our observation. And there's been, there had been some talk uh, amongst the industry that Google Shopping and PLAs were a tail term uh, experience and a tail term product, one that was really uh, advertising for uh, against very product specific uh, search queries. And in fact, though, we're not, we're not seeing that or we're not entirely seeing that. So a couple of examples here. This is a, a recent screen capture for a, 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 a search engine results page for a query of Spenko insoles, which is probably a head or, or torso type of uh, search query. And you can see that um, for this search query, it returns seven product listing ads uh, in, uh, uh, on the page. However, as you get more uh, specific with the search query and, you know, it, it, in this example, start to type in part of a product type, uh, product title, Spanko RX Original Comfort Insoles, now we're only seeing one product listing ad. And in fact, if you get even more specific and type in a whole product title, um, you know, in this particular example, we're not seeing any product listing ads. Um, and then one further, you know, just kind of test case for this, if you enter a UPC, and this isn't for, a, for an insole, but this is, you know, for a, 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 for a UPC, again, no product listing ads uh, were shown. So now all the, the caveats apply that the presentation or whether or not a PLA shown 
shows depends on a whole host of factors a whole host of factors, which include the relevance of the content and the bid on that. But this is generally consistent with what we have experienced so far, which is that PLA is not strictly a, uh, a, a tail term exp uh, experience. Uh, and if you recall, like relative to the, one of the earlier slides I showed about volume relative to paid search text ads, it's, it's material. So it's, it is showing quite a bit. The implications for here um, as I tried to foreshadow, are really around um, structuring and optimizing uh, and the, you know, the massive importance of both of those. So it means things like check your search query reports to see what search queries are performing and not performing and negative against those, those poor performing queries. Make sure that your descriptions and titles are good both from a performance and from a relevance point of view that, um, you know, maximize the opportunity where you serve for both those head and term as well as tail uh, types of queries and structure your product so that what you, what is good performing serves when you would like it to, to as much of an extent as possible. And to answer that, you know, and address these in more detail, because this is probably the top question that we get is about optimization, structuring, and negatives. Uh, Anthony, um, uh, can you please share, you know, thoughts and, and best practices that you've developed and what you've been counseling clients in terms of best practices and structure and negatives? Sure. Thanks, Frank. So, as Frank said, I think the number one question we typically hear from retailers is about campaign structure. Um, I think it's important to understand that Google Shopping is a very dynamic program. Um, with that being said, um, it's important to be creative with your data, uh, be creative with how that data is messaged within the AdWords grouping and AdWords label attributes, and try to leverage your data feed wherever possible. Um, this brings home the point, and I wanted to bring back a slide from our previous, present, our previous webinar last month, um, which talks about the interplay between campaign management and feed management. Um, the coordination between these two components are very important for a Google Shopping campaign and the success of, of scaling that campaign in the long term. Um, today we'll demonstrate a few examples of how to implement campaign structure and throughout the process, I'll talk about how both campaign management and feed management efforts become very important when implementing campaign structure. So on our first example, we have here an all products ad group. Um, the all products ad group is essentially the bare minimum or the basic, most basic structure you could possibly implement for Google Shopping. Um, it's important to also note that this all products ad group is the sole requirement for listing or for, for the 10% PLA discount for uh, for Google um, that's been implemented or will be implemented on August 15th. So I think it's important to note that all merchants should have at least an all products ad group live by August 15th. Um, this bare minimum structure will allow you to market every product in your catalog on Google. You can, of course, choose any CPC you would like to uh, place within the AdWords auction. Any, uh, any CPC over one penny or one penny or more will allow you to qualify for the 10% discount extended by Google. Um, in this structure, we have one best-selling product in the catalog. Now, of course, um, up front, we have identified this is the best-selling product in the catalog, but as we build campaign structure, we're going to look for ways to create more visibility for this individual product. Now, it may be within product category, product brand, et cetera, and we'll demonstrate some examples of creating more visibility and ultim ultimately creating, uh, producing more sales for your best-selling product and all products in your catalog. So on our next example, we have added some basic structure to the Google Shopping campaign. Here, we've used the AdWords grouping attributes to build a separate ad groups for women's shoes, men's shoes, and kids' shoes. Um, in this example, these three are the best-selling categories within my data feed. Um, it's important to also note that categories like shoe accessories are not marketed in a separate ad group and therefore not using an AdWords grouping in this example. Those would be marketed under the all products ad group. So remember when building a campaign that the all products ad group is essentially there to catch products that are new to the data feed that do not yet have structure or to catch products that may not be important or over, 
important drivers of overall success of your campaign. So you want to focus on the best-selling products in your catalog and trying to find levers to increase volume and increase sales on those best-selling products. So we have three ad groups here. Um, and as you can see, our best-selling product here, highlighted in light blue, is now marketed under the women's shoes ad group. So I can have a separate set of ad copy, a separate cost per click or CPA bid set on each of these ad groups, providing additional visibility and additional search volume on each ad group. In our next example, we have added subcategory structure to the Google Shopping campaign. Here, we're using the AdWords label, AdWords grouping, and brand attributes to create subcategory structure at an ad or ad group level. Um, here, we ha within women's shoes, we've added ad groups for heels and flats. So now we can market these two subcategories of product separately from broader searches for women's shoes. So a search for heels or flats can have separate ad copy. Uh, the PLA ad that's served will have separate ad copy and will be, have a separate bid within the AdWords auction. We've done the same within men's shoes for the brand Converse using the brand product target and running shoes, which would be a broader subcategory of men's shoes. However, in this example, would be considered the best-selling men's shoes product in my men's catalog. And finally, under kids' shoes, we've used the AdWords label attributes to build both subgroups for boys' and girls' shoes. So infant's shoes may be marketed under the broader kids' shoes category or ad group. However, boys' shoes and girls' shoes are now marketed in this example at separate ad groups, again, with separate bidding levers. In our next example, we've added further structure to the campaign. Now, not every retailer may need to drill down to this level of structure, but I wanted to highlight a few points here. Um, here we've added additional structure to provide additional visibility on products with a certain color. So here in, uh, in the heels category or heels ad group, we have an ad specific now for black heels. So we can market black heels separately from all other heels in our catalog. Um, within the flats category or flats ad group, we have an ad now for Tom's shoes. We can market our Tom's shoes products at a separate cost per click with separate ad copy than all other flats within our women's shoes catalog. And then finally, on running shoes and on girls' shoes, we've used both pricing filters or price, pricing attributes placed within the AdWords label to make ads specific for price on running shoes and using age attributes to implant age labels within the girls' categories or catalog to add uh, age filters or age labels within the data feed. So here you can see the different levers we've developed by implanting data into the data feed to use for our campaign structure. Um, not having the full ability to modify AdWords labels and AdWords groupings, the merchant would be stuck at high-level categorization and not be able to drill down to the finer points of their data feed. And finally, in our last example, we've added a final structure here of actually providing a SKU level ad group or SKU level ad here for our best selling product in the catalog. Now this may not be suggested for all merchants, but in this hypothetical scenario, this SKU one, two, three, four is far and away the best selling and best converting product in our catalog. So if that is the case, there, it may necessitate separate marketing, separate bidding and separate ad copy for that best selling product versus all others in the feed. Now, in this example, you could, again, use the AdWords grouping or AdWords label attribute to create a separate ad for your best-selling product and market that product separately from all others in your data feed. Remember that it's important to build campaign structure around your product catalog. So it comes back to the initial focus of data quality and really focusing on having high-quality data that allows you to leverage that data most effectively on Google Shopping. And as you build out additional campaign structure, it's important to evaluate negative keywords that serve within your individual Google Shopping campaigns. Here's an example for a search for a Weber stainless steel grill, or the keyword Weber stainless steel grill. You can see from the result set on the left, there's wide variance amongst price and products returned by Google. So if I was a merchant in this example selling a 
uh, the second item, a Weber stainless steel grill tray, I might want to consider evaluating product level performance to see if indeed the term Weber stainless steel grill should be the focus of my marketing efforts on Google Shopping. So next, I'll show you an example of how we would drill down to that level of analysis to decide whether or not that search term is ideal for serving our product. So here, I have an example of a report from Merson Retail where we can evaluate performance by search term, or in this case, search query. So since there's no keywords or search terms to bid upon on Google Shopping, we can collect data on the search query produced by Google that ultimately serves our product. So here's an example for the Weber stainless steel cooking grate in my previous example that shows four products highlighted in red that are generating a high volume of overall click-throughs or referrals, yet not producing conversions at an acceptable rate. These would be key search terms or key queries that I would want to block as ad group or perhaps campaign level negatives. It's important to focus on campaign structure when implementing these negatives. If for this example, the merchant didn't sell, uh, in fact, stainless steel grills and only sold accessories, they may want to consider making the stainless steel grill great term a campaign level negative, removing that product from all PLA ads. However, if there was a specific campaign for a specific ad group for grills versus grill accessories, they may want to consider making only an ad group level negative for the stainless steel grill great to make sure that the product does not serve on that search query. Okay, so now at this point, I would like to turn it back to Frank to talk about the changing face that we've experienced on Google Shopping. Thanks, Anthony. Um, and uh, in the next couple of slides here, there's just, here we want to emphasize, highlight a couple of uh, experiential factors that we are noting that we are, uh, think are particularly uh, interesting and important on the Google Shopping tab. So no longer on the, the SERP, the search and the main search results page, but rather now once a user clicks into the shopping experience. Uh, and certainly we can't cover in the, the time uh, allotted all of these things, but there's, there's like three things here that we think are worthwhile and we want to make sure that uh, the listeners are aware of if, they, if you haven't seen this yet. So here on this page, we're in the Google Shopping experience. So we've clicked into the, the shopping tab and we're looking at what we call a, a, a product uh, listing page or product detail listing page. So this is a product uh, with matched listings. This is the, the page for the Spenco Polysorb Total Support Insole. And it's a matched listing page in the sense that there are several offers from several retailers um, that are available for this, and they're all listed here. So one uh, very important change is highlighted in, in the red oval here, which is uh, now Google is clearly boxing and indicating that these listings are all sponsored. So there's a pay for placement um, aspect uh, explicitly being conveyed to the consumer and the user on the Google Shopping pages. This, of course, did not used to be there. So is letting the, the user know that their you know, bids and pay for placement, does a, is that a fact here? The other thing that you know want to highlight on, on, on this page is the appearance of the Google Trusted Store badge alongside the retailer names uh, for some of these offers. Here against the Wayfair offer, you can see that there's a, a Trusted Store badge. Um, the Trusted Store badge does not directly affect rank, but we believe that there is an indirect uh, uh, effect through improved click-through rate. Google's research that they shared has has indicated that the Trusted Store badge increases click-through rate, and the click-through rate does an increase in click-through rate does improve the quality score of a product, which does then uh, lead to positive impact on rank. So this seems like this is you know, it has an indirect effect and is, is, is a, a, you know, a feature that certainly Google has emphasized when they uh, announced Google Shopping back in May and something that we're keeping an eye on. Additionally, um, the appearance of Google Wallet is uh, also showing similarly as was um, uh, the trusted store. So here there's two screen captures of a, of a different product, uh, the Spanko Polysorb cross trainer insoles. And what's different here with Google Wallet that shifts from the left screen cap to the right one is that Google Wallet is available as a filterable option. So when you select Google Wallet, 
um, you know, the screen capture on the right here shows, and now you're only looking at offers that make uh, that that support Google Wallet. Um, so, you know, we can extrapolate what other kinds of features we might expect to show up as filterable options. But we think this is, uh, you know, the emphasis here on Google Wallet is also notable. The last part of the experience that we wanted to, to highlight and is the appearance of what we are, are just referring to as a quote-unquote a buy box, which we, by, by which we mean is very prominent uh, premium-looking placement in the in the upper right-hand corner of a of a product uh, listing page, again within Google Shopping. This time for a North Face Denali jacket. Um, so so first off, clearly it's marked as sponsored. So there is a, a pay for placement uh, influence ad uh, a aspect here. Um, you know, click through here takes you to the retailer sites to purchase it. There's also this option for add to a shopping list. Based on our experience on other channels, um, we would expect and we do expect a placement like this to be very valuable and to drive a lot of traffic uh, and, and sales. So we think it becomes really important for retailers to understand uh, when they have, you know, quote unquote, a buy box or what their rate of ownership of, of a buy box is and what factors are necessary uh, to garner such a, place, a placement factors that may be in addition to bidding. Um, so these are just a couple of highlights of the changing face of Google that, that we thought were worth touching on. And the implication here is one of thinking a, a ahead. And I, I, you know, I say that because I look at this as a medium to long-term uh, impl implication. Because you know, I think we, we should interpret and take Google at their, at their word and what they're uh, you know, that they're trying to improve the Google shopping experience for consumers. So if we work backward from the consumer and consider what would a consumer expect to be true for a offer that's in that premium buy box placement in the upper right, I think that can give us a good indication of things that uh, retailers should focus on uh, delivering or making sure that Google has information available so that they can highlight those value parts of the retailer value proposition. So these include things like price, uh, quick availability, reliable availability, uh, reliable fulfillment and shipping, customer service, store rating, a lot of those type of things. So working backward from the customer and, and anticipating uh, how, how this experience will change from, from Google's point of view, uh, I think is that in the medium to long term, uh, uh, should be in, in, in retailers' planning minds. The last um, chunk of observation and data that we want to share here is around data quality. And uh, emphasizing or titling this that data quality really matters. This is something we emphasized a lot in our previous webinar. Uh, certainly Google has emphasized it to us and to clients, and we're finding that it, it, it is massively important and it's getting more important. So before leading in here with, with a couple of thoughts from uh, Anthony and John, I want to share one example uh, of, of a data quality case. So this is, this is a retailer um, uh, example, and what we're looking here is, is, is traffic patterns from the combined GPS and PLA, so for both of those channels together. And as you can see in this example, progress was proceeding nicely uh, for a period of time, um, and then at, at a certain point, Google uh, instituted and started enforcing more rigorously certain data quality requirements. This retailer suffered from price mismatch errors, which means the price and the feed didn't match what was on the site, availability mismatch, which means the feed and the site didn't match, and, and in this case, it's not even that there was an error in availability, but rather that the availability as it was messaged on the retailer site was not what was expected by the Google data checking systems or data checkers, and so it ended up being, you know, applied as a, as a, as a negative hit. There were also some missing UPCs, missing descriptions, etc. The net impact was a rather quick and dramatic drop in traffic. So again, emphasizing that this, this stuff around data quality really, uh, really matters. Now, through extensive work with the client on our part, on Google's part, and working collaboratively, we were able to understand and resolve these data quality issues. And as you can see, traffic pretty promptly returned um, to, to, uh, to you know, the range where it was before. And in fact, if I'd extend this, this retailer is 
uh, and client is doing now very well and, in fact, has seen uh, sizable year-over-year growth. So the, the implication here is that, again, quality matters, and what you have to do uh, is, is really look at your, your data quality. A couple of implications are that you have to uh, you know, religiously monitor and correct your errors. You've got to look in the Google Merchant Center and see what's there or use a tool like, uh, like our Immersion's Content Error Resolution tool to go through and fix those errors. Make sure the Google bot can crawl your site. Send feeds more frequently, more frequently to reduce the chance of a price or availability mismatch and integrate with both the, with both the, uh, Google's content and data quality APIs. This is probably, you know, number two or number one, but, you know, ne- along with uh, structure um, in the topics that we get, uh, questions we get from clients. Uh, and, Anthony, I, I know you have a, a bunch of stuff here Can you, uh, that you're going to share with us about how uh, we approach improving uh, data quality and resolving errors. Certainly. Well, thanks, Frank. So, first and foremost, it's important to note that every product sent to Google is messaged with one of four statuses within the Google Merchant Center. Um, these statuses are particular to Google Shopping. So here I have a uh, screen capture of, a, of the graph from a merchant, Google Merchant Center account for the product ads component of the program. Um, there may be multiple graphs in the Google Merchant Center account, but the product ads graph really focuses on those products and product statuses for Google Shopping. So first you have the active status, which is listed in green. Um, Active products are eligible for listing on Google Shopping. Simply, if you have a all products ad group set up in your AdWords account, these products will be active at least on the all products ad group. So again, for the August 15th promotion, uh, having active products and having those associated with an all products ad group will make you eligible for that promotion. The second status is listed in yellow, awaiting review. Um, Awaiting review products, This is a new process for Google Shopping that's rolled out over the last few weeks. Um, This process essentially is controlled on new items to the feed or products pending approval um, that have a changed attribute. Um, John, could you elaborate a bit more on the review process with Google Shopping? Sure, um, no problem. You know, the awaiting review status is a new process, as you probably know, Um, and um, I think it would be helpful for everyone on the call to understand what it means. And it basically applies to any new products or products with significant changes um, because we're going to review all of those to make sure that those new products or those changed products are in compliance with our Google Shopping policies. So this applies to any new product and to any that have significant changes, which generally fit into the category of changing the image, the landing page URL, title or the description. Now the review uh, in nearly all cases happens automatically uh, and it takes less than 24 hours for nearly all products. Uh, So you should just think of it as an extra step that we're implementing to make sure that uh, products are compliant with our policies. Um, And it seems like, you know, most of them are awaiting review when they're missing a key attribute. Uh, And by the way, those kinds of errors are reported on the data quality tab. Um, and eventually, we're going to only show them there in the data quality tab. But I hope that's a helpful overview of what the um, awaiting review status is all about. Certainly. Well, thanks, John. And as you said, a, a product can have both a disapproved or red status and an awaiting review status if it's missing an attribute. Um, but the disapproved products are essentially just that, products that are not approved for listing on Google Shopping, either because they don't meet uh, Google Shopping's listing policy or they're missing key attributes to be able to list on Google Shopping. Uh, These products are messaged as data quality errors within Google Shopping. So when we speak of the importance of data quality, we're really talking about these products that are disapproved for listing because these products are essentially not able to list or at at seeing a decrease in quality score because of the approval process. Um, now, finally, we have the expiring status. Uh, hopefully, none of you see this status present within your account. I know it's not present on this example, but an expiring listing is essentially a listing that has not been updated within 30 days and is therefore about to or has expired on Google Shopping. So it's important to keep your data feed fresh and to update it as frequently as possible. But if over 30 days lapses between an update of a product, that product will expire on Google Shopping. So now to talk a little bit about specific errors 
on Google Shopping. We mentioned the disapproved status. Here's for reference a few examples and ways to resolve Google Shopping errors. I'm not going to cover all the examples today, but I wanted to hit on a few important examples that we've seen present in a lot of merchant accounts. First off, you have the out-of-stock out of product status. Uh, the out-of-stock product status essentially means that the item is listed out of stock on the website or the stock status cannot be read while within the data feed it is listed as in stock. Essentially, this is a very serious error to Google because it does impact overall shopper experience. So you can assume that this will have a very large impact on overall quality score for that product. And I believe, as we've, see, as we've shown, there's definitely some evidence to prove that. Um, next, down the line, we have product crawl issues. Um, product crawl issues essentially mean that the Google bot cannot crawl your product page and therefore cannot verify the information that it will check on out-of-stock status and pricing status. So if you see a Google bot or a product crawl issue, it's very important to prioritize these over any other issue because essentially this means that your, your products cannot be verified by the Google bot before serving. Um, finally, we have two title errors, uh, capitalized titles and long titles. Both are fairly self-explanatory, but it's important to note that there is title policy or title restrictions on Google Shopping. You cannot have all cap titles, and you must make your title less than 70 characters long. Um, failure to comply with either of these policies will have an effect on quality score, so it's important to always try to create a, the most relevant and relevant uh, and targeted title possible within the, the policies that Google Shopping has alongside of title. So we mentioned earlier the Google Content API. I wanted to talk a bit about how the Google Content API helps you resolve these errors as it helps produce this feedback in a real-time fashion and within Mercer Retail allows you the tools needed to effectively edit and modify your products to resolve Google, Google Shopping errors. So here we have an example of a product return from the Google Content API. In this example, you can see Google's responses, this product is missing a color attribute. So first and foremost, in, this is from the channel error resolution tool, we would filter for this product within the channel error resolution tool and modify the content for this product. So on our next slide, we have a workflow where we can edit that product's content. So here we can see that indeed the color attribute below is missing. We can simply edit that color attribute, send it back to Google, and in the next feed, the product will no longer have a data quality error for this individual item. So it's important to consistently monitor your data quality errors and it's important to try to integrate with the Google Shopping API or Google Content API to make sure that those errors are visible in a real-time fashion that can be easily modified and easily investigated. Okay, so I'll turn it back to Frank. Yeah, thanks, uh, Anthony. Um, that wraps up the main part of the content. Um, you know, the, the summary here, you can uh, see it, but just to emphasize you know, I think there is an opportunity to hear, uh, here to it, to be aggressive, focus on structure and data quality. Uh, and in the interest of time, I'm going to turn it back. Uh, that that wraps up the main content. I want to turn it over to Eric to to wrap up. Yeah, thanks, Frank. And just uh, for the benefit of everyone on the webinar today, thanks again for attending. A couple of quick uh, final comments on Mercent. I mentioned at the onset of this presentation today that our job is to make you as a merchant more visible, competitive, and profitable. Um, and the ways that we're intending to do that is to focus first on your uh, catalog data quality uh, that you're communicating to Google uh, in, in the feed. We do provide uh, our own proprietary analytics that provide skew level reporting of your PLA uh, activity as well as uh, Google AdWords and other uh, cross-channel activity. Um, you saw some of those screenshots today. Uh, we are focused on implementing unique campaign structures that are informed by your e-commerce catalog, and that's uh, either automated or at least facilitated within Mercent Retail, which is really true for um, the, the whole set of tools and services. Anything that Anthony has touched on or presented today, uh, um, we, have, we are very focused on building technology that is dedicated to and specific to uh, Google Shopping and product listing apps. Um, I just want to wrap by saying that uh, if you are currently a Mercent client, um, literally three steps in 30 minutes, you can be live through our platform on PLA. If you're not yet a Mercent client, obviously we'd love to have a conversation with you about your needs. 
Um, and uh, again, the, the value add uh, from Mersin is uh, focused across really the entire relationship um, with Google and is not limited to PLA. So uh, everyone, thank you so much for attending today. I want to thank John again for uh, his valuable contribution. Um, and Frank and Anthony, thank you so much for presenting. Uh, and we'll be in touch, everyone. Thank you so much.